So if you want to create your own macro, how do you go about doing it? Well, in the namespace closure.core, there's a macro called def macro, and it's used just like defn. It's basically just like writing a function, except it creates a macro, and it defines it in the current namespace. Now behind the scenes what's happening here is that first it creates a function because a macro function is really not a separate type, it's just a regular function object, but what happens is that the var that gets created, that's mapped to the symbol in the namespace, that var has attached to it metadata that denotes that this is a macro. In the metadata map it puts a key called macro with the value true, and that's what makes this a macro. But there's not any reason that you really have to remember that or even understand it. So just simply use def macro. What Clojure calls a sequence is not actually a concrete collection type. It's actually more of an abstraction for collections. What this means is it's basically anything that you can pass as the argument to the functions first and rest. If I pass a list to the function first, what it returns is the first item in the list. But if I pass the list to the function rest, what it returns is a sequence representing everything in the list but the first. So logically a collection can be thought of the first and the rest, that is one item and then everything else. You may be wondering though, well how is a hash map a sequence, because a hash map is an unordered collection of key value pairs. Well the answer is that if you pass a hash map to first, you get back basically a random key value pair. And then if you call rest with the same hash map, you get back a sequence representing all of the remaining key value pairs. And though you can basically think of the key value pair returned by first as being effectively a randomly chosen key value pair, well, if you call first repeatedly on the same hash map, it's always going to return the same key value pair, so it's not random in that sense. A neat thing about sequences in Clojure is they can actually be what's called lazy sequences. A lazy sequence is a sequence in which the data of the rest is defined wholly or partly in terms of a function, not necessarily data in memory. So let's say that we have a function called infinite seek, which returns a sequence in which the first is provided as an argument, here it's provided as three, so we have a sequence where when we call first it's going to return three, but rest returns another sequence, as rest is supposed to do, and in that sequence the first is one greater than the sequence of the previous first, and when we call rest on this sequence it returns another sequence in which the first is one greater than that first, and so on and so forth ad infinitum. So effectively, we would have a sequence which starts at 3, then goes to 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and on and on and on, and never stopping. It would just go on into infinity. And this works again because the rest in this sequence is defined in terms of a function of the first. So what this code here is going to do is it's going to print 3, then 4, then 5, then 6, and 7, and 8, and so on and on and on and on, and it's never going to stop. You can also have lazy sequences where the rest is defined in terms of a function of not necessarily the first, or just the first, but in fact in terms of other data. So in fact you can have something like a cycle, which is a sequence that infinitely cycles between some set of values. So in that case, the rest function would be based upon some other sequence, like say a list or vector. As we saw earlier, one way we do iteration in functional programming is by using recursion and that way we avoid using anything stateful. We don't have a counter, we don't use iterators, or anything like that. However, in Clojure we use recursion as a last resort. Far more commonly, we use sequence functions to get the same effect as iteration. The idea is that 99% of the time when you want to iterate, when you want to loop, what you really want to do is you want to do something for every item in some collection. So in the Clojure library there are these functions and also some macros whereby we specify some collection, some sequence, and then we also specify what we want to do with the items of that sequence. I won't catalog these uh, functions and macros here, but just understand that these sequence operations are part of the core of what you really need to know to get anything done in Clojure. If you think you might need a loop, well first look at the sequence functions and see if there's something more appropriate for what you need. You may be familiar with the concept of a struct from C or C++. A struct in C is basically a compound data type. Just like an object in Java is made up of fields, well it's the same idea, it's just that a struct doesn't have any associated methods. The closest analog to this idea in Clojure is a struct map. A struct map is basically a hash map except it has a predefined set of keys. 
So whereas in Java you create a class which is a blueprint for instances, in Clojure you create what are called struct map basis objects, which are used as blueprints for struct maps. And the advantage over just a plain hash map is that for the set of keys you define in a basis, the struct maps you create from that basis are optimized for those keys, both in terms of access, time, and space efficiency. So if we're creating these struct maps instead of classes, does this mean that Clojure is not object-oriented? Well, what do we mean when we say object-oriented? The way object-oriented programming is usually defined is by these three properties, encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. Encapsulation can be summed up as pretty much meaning if you have some data type, then there should be a defined set of operations which are exclusively used to access and modify that data. So if I have some type cat, then the only way I'm going to touch a cat object is by using a predefined set of methods for that type. By funneling all interaction with data through this limited interface, the hope is that the integrity of that data is maintained. The idea behind inheritance is simply that when defining a type, you can have it automatically borrow all of the attributes from some other type, including its fields and methods. The idea behind polymorphism in its most generic sense is that a function or operation should be able to change its behavior based upon the types and or number of its arguments. This actually comes in two flavors. You can have runtime polymorphism, in which it's not until the very last minute when the function is actually called that the types are looked at and their number is looked at and determined, then what actually should we do? Or you can have compile time polymorphism, in which, based upon the static typing of the arguments to some function, it's decided by the compiler what the actual function being called is. Polymorphism is not necessarily just about functions, it can be about operations as well. So say in Java, the plus sign operator is actually polymorphic in a compile time sense, because depending upon whether the static types are, say, numbers, then it's going to be an addition operation, but if the, the types are strings, then it's going to be a string concatenation operation. So for starters, can we do encapsulation in Clojure? The answer, it turns out, depends on what exactly you mean. If you expect the language to enforce encapsulation for you, then no, Clojure does not do encapsulation. But just because the language is enforcing you to do something doesn't mean you can't do it. If you want to do encapsulation, all you really have to do is, well, you define your types, and you would do so typically as struct maps, and then you define some set of functions which are the operations for that type. But of course, you can't use the traditional message passing syntax, which we have in Java and C++ and most object-oriented languages, where it's x.y to call the method y of the object x. But I've always found that syntax somewhat silly anyway, because it's really just another way of writing a call to y, where x is some particular argument. Usually we can just say the first. In fact, this is exactly how the syntax x.y works when you call it in Python. It just translates into a call where x gets passed as the first argument. I suppose one downside of doing it this way is that normally in object-oriented languages, the x.y syntax is nice in a way because it actually means that the object is serving as a namespace for methods. When we're just calling a regular function as a method, then that function has to be a part of the current namespace, and it might get a bit messy, but that's really just a peripheral issue that's not really central to code organization. As for inheritance, there's no automatic way in Clojure of taking an existing basis object and creating your own basis object, which inherits all of the keys but then has more stuff, though writing your own function to do just that would be actually quite trivial. Instead, the closest thing that Clojure has to supporting inheritance is a feature it calls hierarchies. The idea behind hierarchies is that you simply take different symbols or keywords and you can create relationships between them such that, say, some symbol X is the parent of some symbol y. So if you create these relationships in your program, what you end up with is a hierarchical tree of some set of symbols and keywords. Now by itself, this hierarchy doesn't do anything, but the idea is that it will come into play when we do polymorphism. 